Hello and welcome everyone to Live at 1 p.m. I am clearly not Elaine Meter Wilkes, even though I am the other duo of the Cynthia and Elaine show. But Elaine is hopefully going to join us here in a few minutes. She's been having a little bit of connectivity issues. And welcome to the virtual festival, which is all about connectivity issues. Today is exciting for me because we get to talk to playwrights and playwrights whose works I love that I've got a chance to read and listen to and get to play with myself. Jim Sampson is gonna be up first here in a few moments and um, he's written some wonderful roles that I are for me and he's not allowed to let anyone else play them, even Elaine, okay? I get to play that card. So today we're going to talk about playwriting. We're gonna talk about words and as Elaine will talk about, as the owner of Webster's Bookstore, I have my Webster's bag up, look at me today. And I have my husband's Afghan quilt up on the colors of pride, which we'll talk about coming up this weekend as well. And is there a cat out there that we might get to meet soon? Nicole's got a cat. Anyhow, words are important. And Steve Connell has a poem that I absolutely love that I read all the time. But one of his lines is, if your words don't define you, why are you talking? And it's so important to get our students, for us to realize how important and the power of words and playwrights do that best of all. So here we go. I'm gonna bring in Mr. Sampson to join us. Hello. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good. So I can out how old we are because the Tempest Productions is 25. This is our, the end of our 25th season heading into 26. And I've known Jim since the beginning. Right? Yay! Yep. And Elaine, what do we think? Can we bring you into the broadcast? We're going to give it a try. How's that? I'm a little echoey. But... All right. So two of my favorite people are now on screen with me. And I'm going to let them take over and talk about playwriting, talk about characters, talk about how brilliant I am as a performer in Jim's <laughs> plays. Otherwise, we're good to go. And I'll be back. Thanks. <laughs> Well, there we go, Jim. We know what we'll be talking about right now. And uh, all of it, of course, is true. <laughs> so, Jim, Tempest has been working with your particular work, as Cynthia said, for 25 years. Can you give us a, like, a brief overview of that history that you have with Cynthia and with Tempest Productions right there in the New York, New Jersey area, correct? So yeah, when Joe and Cynthia formed the company, um, they wanted actors and I happened to know Joe um, and they were, they, they needed actors. So I happily joined and I, it was a great experience. Um, the, the both of them are so good to work with. They're both really good actresses, but they also, the way they run the company is just, you know, they care about the work, they care about the people, they care about the actors. And, you know, they do what they can to make it all as good as possible. I mean, you know, let's face it, that's that's why you do anything, or at yeah. least that's why I do anything. You want to make it as good as possible, and that's what they do. You know, that's what they strive for. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've worked with them as an actor over the years. Um, I started writing about 11 years ago, and... Um, Joe and Cynthia both approached me about doing various writing projects. Um, the only thing I was able to contribute, to, so it just, it hasn't worked out over the years, but when we were putting together uh, The Scarlet Letter, um, Cynthia solicited input. Um, so I read the novel, which I had never done before. Um, and I found this character in it that I, that I just found fascinating. There was one woman in it and she was a really tiny minor character. I don't even know if she had a name, but she seemed to be the only one in the whole story who um, tried to rebel, not, not rebel, but um, uh, uh, you know, offer one um, opposing uh, viewpoint against uh -huh. The, the, the society, the religion, the government, the whole thing. And I thought, okay, she's the one I wanna, so I seized on her and I kind of wrote a part for her um, because I thought, you know, you've got all these people condemning Hester um, yeah. and, and it was all condemnation. And Hester, of course, you know, creates her own life and 
is defiant. And I thought, I just felt we needed one other voice in that community that would sort of be somewhat sympathetic to her. Yeah. So I sort of narrowed in on that slice and that's the part I wrote. And Cynthia did incorporate that character and a good part of what I wrote. So it was just, I, I, I was gratified to see that, but I was, it, I just felt it was nice to have another perspective in this whole group, you know. Um, yeah. So then this year, um, Cynthia's been familiar with my writing, but then this year, the 2020, uh, 2021 season, she invited me to be a playwright in residence and we did the first Friday's series. Yeah. And we've been reading some of my plays, um, a good number of them actually. So most of the uh, uh, evenings were groups of shorts. Mm -hmm. And then we've done, um, I think just one of the full lengths, which was uh, last week. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, that was one of the few dramas I've written. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, and Cynthia was perfect for the lead. And so she, she, she did it um, brilliantly, uh, brilliantly, brilliantly. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, but it was, it was just great to hear the work done. Um, and I got comments, which I, you know, have yet to incorporate, but mm -hmm. um, it's just, again, it's all about making it better, whatever I can make better, you know, um, so. Yeah, nothing you do exists in a vacuum. So having other people interpret your words, bring it to life, you know, it's an interesting thing that you're a playwright, but previously having been an actor, do you think that that, that you look at the process maybe differently or how do you look at the process having been an actor and sort of been the one that, you know, kind of tried those words out in your mouth and, re you know, really got into a character. I know your dialogue is something that I really admire in your work, your ability to really give the actors something to latch onto. There's, you know, it is not just, you're not just moving the plot forward. You're also developing character. So maybe I answered your question, but you can, <laughs> you can well, go. I mean, in a way that's it. Um, so I will say in most, most of my characters, there's a bit of me. Um, you know, even in the awful, terrible characters, I'm like, okay, you know, what, how, if I were going to play this part, how do I make it human? Um, and, you know, <laughs> even in most of my characters, male, female, good and bad, um, there's a bit of me in there somewhere. Um, it can be one line, it can be a personality trait, it can be whatever. Um, I think the way I do approach it is, if I were playing this part, what what kind of lines would I want to say? Yeah. Um, and truthfully, I think I think I'm good with dialogue. I think I'm weaker with plot. Um, I'm always getting the comment, you know, more action on stage, too much talking, more action on stage. So that's something I have to push myself to improve. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to dialogue, I think I think I do that well, and I think. The main reason I do it well is because I'm an actor. And again, I know what lines I'd want to be saying if I were this character, you know. I know I I I mean, even in dramas, I there's always humor. Um, because none of life is all all serious or all funny. You know, there there it's always a mix. Usually it's more of one than the other, you know. Um, and I think often plays that try to mix the two equally have a problem because producers, directors, actors, audience kind of don't know where to put it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, as an actor, I mean, I'm always, I, I'm always putting myself in the part and, 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 you know, okay, how does this character get to the next scene logically? You know, how does this character go from one um, uh, sentiment or thought to the next one? Um, so as an actor, I mean, I'm, I'm putting myself in there going, okay, it's got to be logical somehow. There's got to be a thought process. There's got to be logic somehow. So yeah, that definitely influences and guides my process, you know? Yeah. And I wonder, like, because you have the training as an actor, you understand that process of answering all those questions for yourself. Mm -hmm. But have you ever been involved, watched someone bringing your piece to life and thought, 
wow, I never saw it that way, whether they were successful or not. Like, have you, have you experienced that where, where an actor just totally went somewhere you hadn't imagined? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, when that happens, it's wonderful because, yeah. and, and it's also very enlightening because, you know, I write the characters and I tend to think, you know, I know the character, the, the eyes, the playwright, of course, have a thought process, but I give a thought process to the characters. But when an actor takes a part and, you know, if I haven't said anything and he or she interprets the words in a whole other way, um, sometimes I don't think it works because I, I don't know that it's going to lead logically to the next action or thought or sentence. But there are many times, of course, when the actor takes it and they're just playing with it or they're trying it out or whatever. And yeah, I mean, seriously, it gives me goosebumps when somebody brings a whole other meaning to it. And it's like, oh my God, that's, that's great. You know, I just, right. I love the, I love the other perspective. You know, I, again, I know I have <laughs> often with my characters, I have one way that I think they need to be played and then <laughs> an actor comes in and does it. And it's like, okay, yeah, that'll work. You know, I mean, and, and it, the thing is, I think with me, and I've said this to the actors in my pieces, it's all about getting it. Do you get the play? Do you get the character? Do you get what I'm trying to do? If they get it and then they're giving it a, a different interpretation or they're doing it in a way that's still going to logically lead to the next step, then uh -huh. that's fine. That's fine with me, you know. Um, and sometimes they just don't get it, you know. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can only do so much about that. But when they get it, it's 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 a playground. It's everybody's playground, you know. And I'm I'm happy with it. They seem to be happy with it. So, you know, I feel like I feel like I've done I feel like I've done good work, but I feel the actor is also doing good work as well because he or she's finding other other yeah. corners of this part that I hadn't thought of. Yeah. Well, and I think uh you know, it's powerful to recognize that not every piece is going to end up to be a Broadway show. And there's space and there's um, power and uh, and gratitude for the regional performances, for the, for the, you know, the process itself of writing these plays, of, of you know, just being together. And Zoom has certainly, you know, not all of us would rather be in person you know, doing these things. But it's been kind of nice having the New York and the Pennsylvania and the Jersey and the California and the Virginia, you know, having all these people get together and, and share our love of these, of the theater, of reading these pieces and bringing them to life. So we really are so grateful, Jim, that you've been involved in the first Friday reading series. And we, we can't wait to maybe do one of your pieces live. How about that? <laughs> Well, I'm grateful to, to Joe and Cynthia for having invited me to do it. But uh, and yes, after the last piece, I think Cynthia so fell in love with the part she read that uh, I, I have a feeling that that's going to be on the horizon. Really. <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm like, Jim, we need to do this. I even yes. have all the costumes in storage. We can do this. Art in between life, life, right? It does. So... Today is once again all about the playwriting competition and the playwriting festival and celebrating all of our authors and our playwrights. And we are lucky that we have a few of them in the studio with us. And I'm going to add them in. Hopefully they're listening Yay. and know I'm going to do this to them. Hey, Hello. welcome. Hello. Hey, great. So we started this morning at 11 a.m. with the short shorts, of which the three of you there all had shorts that were read this morning. And Nicole has a piece that is being read in the one act this afternoon. The recordings from this morning will stay up on the festival page and will be available so you can go back and take a look at that. And then we have a reading at 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and 6 p.m. And we'll talk more about that as we go. So Elaine, yeah. I'm gonna let you Go ahead and grill these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We're so honored that you joined us. I'm just going to stop uh, a start uh, with 
what is my upper screen here? I have Nicole here, and then Kara, and then Eric. If I could just start with Nicole. Oh my goodness, and your adorable <laughs> little kitten there. If you could just introduce yourself and tell us a, a couple sentences about you and the piece that you brought to the festival, or I should say that we chose because you're a winner. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole DeSalle, and I am in Iowa City, Iowa. And uh, this morning, uh, two of my short plays were read. Uh, one was called Broken Bluebird, and the other was called Moth and Butterfly, a love story. And then uh, this afternoon at four, uh, my one act play, uh, Big Top Love, is going to be read. Awesome, awesome, awesome. awesome. Kara? Kara? So I'm Kara Davidson. Um, I am currently in Omaha, Nebraska, getting my MFA in writing for stage and screen. Um, but before that, I've been in Chicago for the past eight years, um, working as an actor, a writer, um, theater artist, um, and um, teaching artist. Okay. Excellent. And Eric. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I'm Eric Thomas. I'm uh, from the Cincinnati area. Uh, I've been writing for about four years and acting for about seven in the community theater area there. And my Great. play that I brought today or that they was selected is called April is No Fool. It's a um, a mystery yes. somehow, a detective mystery in 10 minutes. Yes, which is no small feat, Eric. I will have to say, um, just to give folks an idea of how the playwriting festival works. We received, I believe, a hundred and six or 108 uh, short pieces and the committee read all of those and then additionally re received about I think it was about 45 one acts again the committee the selection committee works throughout the year furiously to to uh, you know reduce that number down to three winners in each category I guess the shorts there's actually more but what that entails is lots of different opinions points of views on the committee and it's a really uh it's all done blind so in other words nicole the fact that three of your pieces were picked is just your pieces really resonated um and and not just with one person on the committee with many um you know at much like eric's your piece was this i don't know how i I witnessed it. I still don't know how you wrapped up a mystery in 10 minutes. Well done. And Kara, I apologize. Tell me again your piece that won. Oh, I didn't say it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's called The Farewell Burn. Right. I don't know there was a bird theme this year. <laughs> oh, burn, B U R N. Burn. There we go. That makes more sense. I was going to say, I don't remember one title that. Okay. I'm up to speed now. Um, just like most actors, I'm usually faking my way through things. So thank you very much for that, Kara. So let's start back with Eric. And so you've been acting for seven years, writing for four. What took you to the pen and page? My home theater um, has a, uh, a yearly short play festival weekend. And uh, I was running backstage crew for it. And um, I just, I don't know, I, I, these were, the, it's focuses on local authors. Um, it's called Home Brew Theater, where it's local authors and local beer. And um, working backstage, I, I just thought, I, want, I bet I could write one of these. Let me try. And, uh, and I did. And it was on stage uh, the very next year. And um, I got the... I guess, you know, as an actor, there's the, the joy you get is in solving the puzzle and finding what these words mean for the character. And it's a process of interpretation and f finding things that maybe have never been found before. And that's, the I guess, the piece that I find really engaging about acting. When I switched to playwriting and when talented actors and directors are embracing the work and then involving themselves in it and adding to it and finding things that I didn't know were there, kind of like what Jim was talking about earlier. Um, that, that's like a double reward because I, it's it's these talented people engaging with the work and then the audience engaging with what they brought to it. It's so it's I get the reward from the actors and then the reward from the audience. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a really um, difficult drug to kick. <laughs> so I really enjoy it. <laughs> Well done, well done. Thank you, Eric. So, Kara, for you, um, I believe your piece is a one act, correct? Uh, ten minutes. Yours is also a ten minute. Okay. Um, 
So what what for you is the process? You I you had said you're a teaching artist, you're an act, actor as well. So for you, where did that step into the playwriting world come from? Um, well, I always joke that it happened in third grade. Um, I wrote a, an adaptation of The Hobbit. Um, I was in a production of The Hobbit. Um, I was playing Goblin number two and I had no lines, so they didn't give me a script. So I, instead I went to rehearsal every day and I uh, recreated my own ad adaptation and I made my third grade class perform it at recess and at lunch. And, and I played Bilbo Baggins. So I feel like that encompasses my experience as a playwright, playwright and actor. Um, and in college, um, in my undergrad years, um, I, I was actually a theater and French major, so I was doing two different programs simultaneously and also in the honors program, so I had to do two different theses. And so instead, I decided, well, why don't I combine this? Um, and uh, I wrote a play in both French and English and performed it with subtitles and mixed media um, and then wrote my thesis on that. So it was really me just combining the work all together. Um, yeah. But that really started me off onto this path of writing and producing my own work. Um, work that I would sometimes act in, but not always. Um, and I liked what Jim was saying before is that um, I also approach characters in the very same way. I, I, I think about um, how each character is a faction of some part of my psyche. Um, and I want to make sure that I would want to play every character in my script as an actor. Um, if I don't, then something's wrong and I needed to go tweak that um, because I think there's always a, a nugget there to, to look for. Um, as a playwright, but also as an actor. So, um, so for the past ten years, I've been now writing and producing, um, and and being produced as a playwright, um, and kind of shifting my focus in that in that direction. Yeah, fantastic, excellent. And Nicole, how about you? Uh, you know, what was the beginning of your start as a playwright? And you know, anything else you want to add to that? Well, I'm, I'm very new to playwriting. Um, my my background is actually in fiction writing and creative nonfiction. And then I started doing community theater um, here in Iowa, just as a, a way to meet people and, and be sociable. And um, I really, I really enjoyed the process. But I started realizing that the fun part for me was really um, getting absorbed in the text and thinking about the character and building a background and a history for that character. And once I got on to the actual like show part, by then I was kind of like kind of done like like that part was kind of made me really nervous I don't really like being on stage I don't like wearing costumes and makeup um but I met a lot of great people along the way and so um I started um writing plays um that you know with people in mind that I wanted to work with again you know, the, you know and um so yeah that's how I started and I agree I mean for me and and like Eric said, it's the drug that you can't kick. I mean, I also feel very hooked on that process because for me, the end game is so much more rewarding. You know, when, when you write fiction or creative nonfiction, it's great if you get it published, but then this is just so much more magical for me, like to then see like, okay, now I've written something and the next step is seeing how people are gonna interpret it and, you know, and, and how they're going to play with it and how it brings them joy. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it re I really sort of stumbled into it and I'm just so glad that I did. Yeah, I, I definitely can sense your fiction, um, you know, upbringing in, in your pieces. That makes so much sense now that you've said that. Um, mm -hmm. I like books. But um, so I wanted to quick, just, oh, Cynthia, yes. <laughs> Before I, you go I, there, I have a question. Yeah. So this is the best thing about having the controls. I don't have to say, put me up there. I can do it all myself. Um, so as an actress and director, right, what comes to me obviously are characters, right? Yes, plot lines are important, but dialogue, these words, these rich characters that you want to embrace. I want to know from each of you, and we can kind of start with Jim and Elaine, you can call them out. Who is your favorite character that you've created? Like the one that you love, right? that is just close to your heart, that no matter what, this is that person that you carry around with you. So think about that and why, tell us why, like what was it about that character? Okay, I'm gonna go. Yeah, and I, I adding to that too a little bit, Cynthia, I'm curious, cause one of you mentioned this, was that character someone you had in mind that you know from your community theater or otherwise your experience? So Jim, go ahead. Oh boy. Um, well, I I have to say, okay, with a gun to my head, I, I might have to pick. Uh, so I've written a, a 
a, a three act um, farce, Commedia dell'arte farce based on three Vermeer paintings. And um, the Vermeer paintings all have uh, a woman and her maid. I don't know if you're familiar with Vermeer, but uh, there's always the woman in the yellow satin jacket with the ermine trim. And in three of them, uh, there are letters, um, the letters figure somehow. So um, anyway, I wrote uh, the, the, um, the woman's name is Oblivia Ditzentwerp and her maid is Trixie Sharpwit. Um, I have to say Trixie might be my favorite character. She's the all-knowing maid. She runs the whole show. She, she's smarter than everybody else in the whole thing. Um, despite the, you know, the character, Oblivia's got all kinds of education, but she's got a kind of a blind spot where men are concerned and her bad poetry, which is all about turnips. Um, so I think I'd have to say Trixie. Um, she's the one that she's got asides to the audience. She, she just knows everything. Everybody's paying her to help them. And of course, everybody's scheme is conflicting with everybody else's, but she's taking money from everybody, you know. Right, right. <laughs> in, the end, in the end, she 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 wins like most of the other characters. So nice. I have to say Trixie. Okay. And Nicole, how about for you? Is there one that resonates particularly? Sure. Um, last year I wrote a play called Oscar, um, which was actually performed outdoors. And I wrote it so that we could socially distance the actors. Um, and so we could have live theater in the middle of a pandemic, which, you know, is was not really happening very much. And uh, so it's four neighbors, and so they're each on their porches. And when the play opens, there's this sort of large asteroid-like celestial object in the sky. So my favorite character was a character I wrote called Beverly. Everybody sort of has these different responses and reactions to this thing in the sky that may or may not be heading towards Earth. And so Beverly's reaction to it was that it was the Lord's work and that it's, it's a blessing and we shouldn't be afraid of it. And so one of the ways that she, you know, kind of one of the comical aspects is that she keeps populating her front lawn with these, with, um, with these crosses, you know, that are like a tribute to the thing in the sky. And, um, in this, and then in the second act, um, like a delivery man comes in with a really large cross. But, you know, I really, I really liked uh, Beverly as a character because she's uh, somebody that in the very beginning of the play, you, you kind of hate her. You know, because, um, you know, she's, you know, she's um, very righteous and um, she doesn't get along with the others. She's, you know, not afraid of while everyone else is. And but then, you know, you throughout the play, she really becomes more vulnerable and you kind of realize, you know, her motivation for what she's doing. And and the um, the actress that played Beverly was a very good friend of mine. And, and it was just really nice to see her step into that role and and, and really um, you know, bring her own take on it. And uh, so it, it was a really rewarding experience. Nice, nice. And Kara? I think this is such a hard question. <laughs> but, yes, um, what's, what's your favorite book, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's too many to count. But if I had to choose, um, I, did a, I did a commission for um, a school, a high school in Chicago um, a couple of years ago, and it was with their advanced drama class. And so I had the um, pleasure of sitting down with the students and basically meeting with them the year before and saying, hey, what kind of show do you want written just for you? What kind of characters you want? do you want written just for you? Um, and in the process of writing that piece, um, uh, I really learned that um, the thing I love about characters is, is multi-dimensional characters. Characters are never one thing. Um, they're in playwriting, we talked about the 90-10 rule. They're 90% one thing, but they're 10% the opposite. Um, and so it was a big challenge being able to write roles that everyone would want to play and that they would feel had some meat in the story. And I think it was, um, uh, I, I learned it was very successful when I had um, people who are all drawn to different characters in their, I want to audition for this character um, because they all attach to something differently. But I think my favorite character in that piece, um, she's a side character, her name's Addie. Um, and she is, her 90% is like, she's the welcome wagon and she's the, the positive force and she's the, the go-getter. But then there's this 10% um, sadness, um, this um, uh, fear of abandonment that she has that she holds with her. So most of the play, she's funny. She has all the like, funny lines and then she knocks you in the heart um, about three, three, three fourths way through the play um, ha and has a huge character dynamic change throughout the, the journey. So I really, I loved writing her because I loved surprising the audience with 
um, her heart as well. So nice. if I have to pick. Uh, I know. <laughs> Great. And Eric, what about you? Some favorites? Uh, well, I'll just rather than pick a favorite, I'll pick a recent favorite because it's that's easier. Um, <laughs> last last month, uh, a local um, company asked, uh, or they were asked to perform theater for young people outdoors, and so a year ago they asked me to write something for it. And um, there's a character that I had had that I would tell stories to my kids about this character named Donkey Donkey, and Donkey Donkey was very simple and always had. Um, liked his life just as it was, but then his friend Blue the Bird would always come in and, and give him a bunch of, hey, you know, this is going on, or there's going to be a big soccer game, or, you know, whatever the challenge of the story was. And I would tell my kids these bedtime stories about Donkey Donkey. And so when the theater company asked me for a theater for young people piece, uh, I decided to write a play about Donkey Donkey. And um, I wrote it in rhyming verse, and uh, it's silly and charming. And then the company that performed it brought so much depth to it but you know donkey donkey is just this simple and you know largely shy and thinks that he can't do whatever it is and then by the end of the play somehow by his simplicity he's able to do the thing that nobody thought that he couldn't do that nobody thought could happen and um i, I don't know i just when the actor who played donkey donkey in the play got it and was reading it was contacting me was just um he uh, so it sounds a little braggy, but anyway, he was just saying this is so. There's so much to this character that I that I can't wait to do, and uh, it, it was I don't know. I guess it was it was a really rewarding thing to pull this character from. Probably 15 years ago was when I was telling Donkey Donkey stories to my kids as I tucked them into bed, and then to have that character be on stage and have a whole crowd of people outdoors watching it happen. So that's it's just it was a really rewarding character to see brought to life. Yeah, that's beautiful. I wanted to give you all a moment to just raise your hand. If there's a question you want to ask someone else here on the panel, please go ahead. I think playwrights rarely get a chance to be together and talk about their work together. So um, if something came up while you were listening to anyone talk, please raise your hand and ask a question. I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, I wanna, I'll ask Jim, but Karen, Nicole, if you want to pipe in as well. Jim, you're talking about the difficulty of plot. I have yet to write a full length play. Um, and I've written whatever, a, a, a drawer full of 10 minutes and a one act. And I have ideas about a full length play but I just, I, I've written the first scene of it and I think I know where it's going, but I, I just can't get the pieces, the puzzle pieces to line up. And I don't, I guess that's the, that's my current struggle is there are all these people who are just really, uh, can produce a ton of work and really productive and, I, and I'm and i not there and I don't, I don't know. I just, I feel stuck trying to get a 10 minute play done. I mean, sorry, a full length play done. I think, um... <laughs> Yeah, I so I belong to a playwriting group, um, and we discuss things like this all the time. I think the first thing you have to figure out is, uh, will your idea support being a whole a full length play? Because you know sometimes you you can start something and you get to thirty or forty pages and it feels done, but if you try to stretch it, it just gets contrived and too thin. So I think that that might be the first thing is will whatever story you want to tell support being a full length and you know full length can be you know 80 90 pages it doesn't have to be 120 you know and nowadays I don't think producers even want something that long um you can talk to Cynthia about that but uh but um yeah so that's the first thing then you got to plot it well you got to Plot it out. I mean, it, like the 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 farce I just mentioned. Um, so the uh, I took a couple of playwriting classes about eleven years ago, and the guy who taught them, who is the leader of the playwriting group I belong to, his style is just oh, just sit down and write, and it'll come to you, and blah blah blah. Well, that's great if you've got a ton of experience, but if you don't, you can write yourself into a corner, and then you know you got to go back and unweave the whole thing so you can keep going with it. Um, I tend to be more of a plotter, you know, I gotta, I gotta lay some things out or sometimes with some things I've written, I have to say, when I sit down to write a scene, I'm like, my, my first question has to be, what is the scene going to accomplish and how's it going to contribute to the story? Um, and, 
you know, I mean, the, the, I wrote one play where I wrote these three great scenes and I brought them in and, and people made comments and I realized now those three scenes had to go out um, because I realized that a different perspective had to happen. Um, but, and oh, so the farce I wrote, I actually had to sit down and make a chart of here's how it starts. It can go one of two ways. And then each one of those can go two ways. And I had this full legal page filled with all the choices I could have made. And what I had to do was basically just go from choice to choice to choice. And that's how I ended up with that one. Now, that was the most plotted thing I've ever done. But um, it's just, you know, as I said, you got to, you got to, I mean, and again, another part of it is where are you beginning? Where do you want to finish? And how do you get there? You know? Now, that I think better playwrights will take you on all kinds of twists and turns to keep it um, interesting. Um, but, I, you know, those are kind of the pieces. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Oh, but, that's very um, helpful. But some, you know, those, the, I guess those are just some of the processes I've used to create full-length things. And, and sometimes, often, my full-length things will start with a book. Um, I come across a great book, and, and actually, I guess I'm thinking of the two. I've written two history pieces, um, and I read I read this book. I, I, you know, I love history in general, but then I re read a book on this little known aspect of some bigger story, and I was like, oh, this would be great. And so I know generally where that is going to end. I know kind of where I want to start, mm -hmm. and then getting between the two is the is the challenge. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. help but notice, Nicole, you were nodding along. Do you have something to add to that? Um, well, just uh, just that idea of thinking about structure and that I that I also feel like I'd, I'd be lost. With, I'm also very new to this. So, you know, I, and, oh, and I feel like uh, for me, I, I agree, Eric, the most challenging thing is, is, the, is, is the full length play and all that space and knowing if the idea that you have can support, um, you know, 90 pages. Um, and some of the things that, that have just helped is um, besides actually plotting my own work is thinking a lot about um, one of the things that happened with the pandemic is I was listening to a lot more plays, you know, over, over audio and over podcasts. And what was nice about that is that I could always see in minutes, like when certain things were happening in the play and it made me so much more aware of structure and, mm -hmm. and how, um, and how the play is progressing than if I was in an audience sitting there. And, and I've actually like gone through some of the plays that I really enjoyed the most. And I've actually made notes just, you know, okay, this was, this would be happening on page, you know, seven, this would be happening on page 35. This is happening at the act break. And so it, it, there's something about listening that made me just much more aware. And that was very helpful. Yeah. Cool. Kara, do you have anything you want to add to that idea? Have you struggled and, and thought about, about this full length challenge um, yourself? I mean, I actually probably struggle on the other side of things. I like writing full lengths. Um, the 10 minute and five minute are harder for me because I feel like you still have to have everything that there is in full length, but it's condensed. Um, and for me, um, like you're saying, structure is, is, is the key. And I'll often outline before I set out to write the full length. Um, uh, if I'm stuck, I'll go back to the Joseph Campbell myth, myth structure, um, where we start out at a status quo. The hero goes to a special world to make the journey um, and then arrives back in a, in a new status quo. And something about that cyclical uh, structure really helps me organize my thoughts. Um, and uh, so if I'm stuck, I, I use that. But um, yeah, I, I like that there are these guides out there that are like by the page 15, you've had your inciting incident. And by page 35, this thing happens. Sometimes the rules of the world of playwriting can really uh, ignite the creative side of playwriting in an interesting way. It's the left right brain working together in a really fascinating way. Yeah, well, that was great. That was wonderful. Um, I We could talk for hours, no doubt. And uh, we'll stay on uh, all of you if you can for a few minutes afterwards so I can kind of get you 
reconnected and, and thank you. But we're going to end our broadcast because we have some, the, one of the one act winners is coming on at two o'clock. So we want to make room for that, this room to be repurposed for that. So I want to thank you all. We're also going to run um, a little short thank you for our sponsors, but I'll see all of you back in the green room after our video runs. Thank you so much for joining us today during the Central Pennsylvania Theater and Dance Fest live at one. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. The Happy Valley Adventure Bureau would like to welcome everyone to the annual Central Pennsylvania Theater and Dance Fest. Dad, I need to plug in. Happy Valley Adventure Bureau. I'm Agent Chipper. This is Agent Friendly. Added some more fun today, folks? Nope. You leave me no choice but to write you a ticket to Happy Valley. Here in Happy Valley, there's a good time around every turn. It's an adventure waiting down every path. All at an affordable price. Just another adventure. Here in Happy Valley. Thank you for joining us in this virtual event. We hope to welcome you to Happy Valley, Pennsylvania very soon. From the Happy Valley Adventure Bureau and happyvalley.com, we wish you a happy 2021 Central Pennsylvania Theater and Dance Festival.